Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good? Yeah. It's Palm Sunday. How many of you guys knew it was Palm Sunday? Yeah? I was going to wear my Palm shirt, but it's too small for me now. <laughs> yeah. Disappointing. Right, I wore her Easter shirt, her resurrection shirt. Dress. All right, well, you guys know the drill. You guys can stand up, and let's pray before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we can come before you. And, uh, Lord, we're just so humble before you because you are awesome. You're high and lifted up, and we just want to lift you even higher. We just want to praise you even more, God, and, and show our love right now. And so I pray, God, that uh, you just calm our hearts, that you just bring peace in this place. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit uh, will guide us into a beautiful time of worship and that uh, we can truly see what it is uh, to surrender. And God, uh, I think we all knew that, especially when we became Christians, but if we've forgotten that, I pray, God, that we can surrender to you again and uh, just surrender every part, not just the parts we choose, but every part of our heart to you. And so I thank you for this time. Thank you that we can worship you and sing unto you. I just pray uh, that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit, God, with your manifest presence. That's in Jesus' my name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
And you came to my rescue and I
bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still call the sea to still. The rage of me to still.
Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Cool. All right. How are you guys doing? Good? Good. Good to see you guys. Well, today is Palm Sunday, right? And I forgot to wear my palm outfit, but <laughs> yeah. Anyone else wear their palm stuff? No? See Ninja Turtles back there. I don't know what that is. <laughs> but uh, all right. So today, normally I just get into it. No, normally I just read a joke. So I'm just going to read jokes, you know? Not... <laughs> It's all service. I'm just going to be reading jokes. So, I think it's nice because, like, Shariah was looking at my notes. She's like, wow, this is convicting. And so, a uh, spoonful of sugar, how's it go? Helped some medicine go down, right? So, maybe these jokes would help, you know. And then I can convict you. I'm just kidding. God will convict you, not me. But we shouldn't walk in shame, right? What's the difference between conviction and shame? Anybody know? Freedom. Freedom? Yeah, conviction is where God tells you something to change, and you can change it. But shame is just where you walk in it, and you're not, you, can't, you feel like you can't change it, and you just are depressed. But conviction, we can change God, by the grace and strength of God. Amen? Amen. All right, so here's some jokes. I've got a ton of them, so I'm just going to pick them at random. So why shouldn't you marry a tennis player? Because love means nothing to them. You guys get it? I don't have a girlfriend, but it says, my girlfriend said to me, I'm sick of you pretending to be a detective. I think we should split up. I said, good idea. We can cover more ground that way. <laughs> Someone like that one. What's the difference on that? Never mind. I won't sing that. Read that one. Every morning I get hit by the same bike. It's a vicious cycle. <laughs> Two windmills are standing in a field. One asks the other, what kind of music do you like? The other one says, I'm a big metal fan. <laughs> I hate metal. That's the, I think that's the worst type of music. <laughs> knock, knock. Amish. You're not a shoe. <laughs> Get it? I'm a shoe. I'm a shoe. <clears throat> There's a lot of married ones, and I'm not even married, but this one says, the other day my wife asked me to pass her lipstick, but I accidentally passed her a glue stick. She still isn't talking to me. <laughs> Good idea? <clears throat> I don't know if this one's appropriate, but it says, I have an EpiPen. My friend gave it to me as he was dying. It seemed very important to him that I have it. <laughs> that's, that's sad. That's not good. Why are you guys laughing? All right, I better just stop right there. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the message. So God wants our best, right? How many of you guys know that? Yeah, God wants your best. We don't just sing that he's holy and that he's worthy for nothing, but he really deserves it. And he actually demands it, and he has the right to, right? We love worshiping at Calvary, right? How many of you guys love worshiping? I love to worship. And we encourage you to worship and not just give what you feel, but give more, right? Because how many of you guys have a bad day anytime, any days, yeah? Yeah, we all do sometimes, but that's why we can't just give what we feel at the moment. We, God never said just give when you feel like giving, did he? 
through the Old Testament and throughout the whole New Testament, we see that God is very clear. He's very clear about what types of offerings that is, are acceptable to him, right? The first one that I think of is in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. It says, When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a, brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. So what do we see here? We see that God's a vegetarian, right? No, that's my dad's joke. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he doesn't like, he's not a vegetarian. That's what I meant. I already messed it up. I need to let my dad tell that one. But <laughs> here we see that there's acceptable offerings, and then there's ones that aren't acceptable, right? And sometimes we just choose, we're like, oh, well, I'm just going to give God this. But he asked, he's actually asking for something different. And if that's, if that's the case, then we're, we need to give what God asked for, right? We can't just think, oh, I'll just give him some fruit when he, he asked for a lamb, right? And that's why it's so important to be in God's words so that we know what he's asking for. How many of you guys know it's easy to give leftovers, right? But to give a brand new meal, that, that costs a little more, right? It's a little more value to it. You know, I can give you my stinky socks because I have other pairs of socks, right? But I wouldn't do that to you guys. But I could, my guitar, that's a lot more value to me, right? So that would be a lot harder to give. And so when you're thinking about God, sometimes in worship and things like that, it's easy to give leftovers. And it's also really easy to give leftovers, especially when you compare yourselves to others. How many of you guys have found yourself comparing yourselves to others? Yeah? And those of you who don't raise your hand, you probably still do, and you don't even notice it. But at times you might think, well, I give more to God than those people do. How many of you guys have, have had your flesh rise up and say something like that? Yeah, I bet we all have. But God says, no, enough doesn't cut it, right? Enough isn't enough because he's the judge, and he's the one who truly sees our hearts. So don't compare yourself with a lukewarm Christian because you might be a little better than them, but that's not going to get you to the place, that's not going to get you where God wants you to be. You're just going to plateau. You're just going to stay in one area, and you're not going to progress. And so picture a sacrifice. If God asks for an ox, and then you see your friend over there, he just throws a bone with a little bit of meat on it, then you're like, oh, my friend just gave that, so I'll just give a bone with a little more meat than my friend. But if God asks for an ox, you need to bring an ox. And I know that you guys are like, what, an ox? Because we don't live in the Old Testament, right? We don't understand sacrifices as much as they did back then. So how many of you guys have ever heard, what if God brings me to Africa? How many of you guys have heard that or sends me to Africa, right? So think about that. What if God did ask you to leave your home, to leave your, your friends, and take your family to Africa? But then you see you see another lukewarm Christian, and you're like, well, they only go to church a couple times a year, so I'm just going to go a little bit more than them. That's kind of the same idea here. And we'll see this morning that giving leftovers to God doesn't cut it, and that we'll even see that it's evil at times. So the title of today's message is No More Leftovers. Would you guys say that with me? No More Leftovers. And you guys can turn to Malachi chapter 1. We're going to look at... A big portion of that today. So Malachi chapter 1. It's in the Old Testament. The last book. Malachi chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 6. You guys there? Yep. All right. I'm going to pray before we get into the word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this beautiful time of worship, and God, I pray that uh, we would learn how to give you a sacrifice of praise, even when we don't feel it, even when we're having a rough day, even when we're tired maybe, or maybe when we're distracted, that you would help us, just give us the mind of Christ, Lord, and I just thank you for your word, thank you for what you're going to be teaching us this morning, thank you for what you're going to be teaching me as well, God, I pray that you would use me as a vessel of honor, God, that I will be able to say every word that you've called me to say here today. 
that I won't shrink back and I won't put all my stuff in there either. But instead, I pray that, uh, that I can just humbly let you shine through me. And I just pray that your people would hear from you, God. They would hear that rhema word from you. That your Holy Spirit uh, would just penetrate their heart with the word. And I thank you, God, that, uh, that you deserve everything. That you deserve much more than what, even what we give sometimes. And we're sorry for that, God. We ask for forgiveness. And we ask that, uh, that if we are convicted this morning, uh, that we would not just go and walk in shame, but that we can uh, rejoice that we have you, our Savior, and that you can give us the strength and the power to live for you. And so I thank you for that, and thank you for what you're going to do this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right, so how easy is it for you guys to fill yourself self up with other things, like the, fill yourself up with the world, and then just give God the leftovers. How, how easy is that for you? It's pretty easy, right? We don't even need to think about it most of the time. Most of the time, we don't because we are so selfish. Our flesh wants to be satisfied, right? We always talk about, and my dad always says, even coming out of the womb, you're selfish. You say, mine, mine, right? You say that right away. And so, how many of you guys know that acronym? It's called, well, you say joy. Do you guys know the acronym for joy? Yeah? What's the first one? J is for who? Jesus, right? To love Jesus first. And then O is for who? Others, yeah. So you love others. And then what's the last one? Yourself, yeah. And how many of you guys get that backwards sometimes? I get that backwards all the time. And what does it end up spelling? Y- yoj, yaj, yeah. It's not even a word, so don't spell yaj. Spell joy, amen? But we really do tend to love ourselves. And then, and then we tend to love others next, you know. And the, the reason we tend to love others is because we just want to please them to get affirmation for them. So it's still kind of selfish. And then if we have anything left over, sadly we give it to God. But most of the times, it not, it's not sad that we give it to God, but it's sad that we come to him and just give him the leftovers. And most of the time it's just demands too. And so that's showing how selfish we really are. That's why we need God. Amen? Amen? So that's why it's hard sometimes when we hear God's word because our flesh doesn't like it. Our flesh doesn't like it when the Bible says to love your enemies or when the Bible says to pray for those who hurt you or to give, right? To tithe like my dad taught on last week. And we don't like it because of our selfishness. But as a Christian, what does God call us to do with our lives? To let it go, right? To surrender. And you see that God is trying to teach that throughout the whole Bible, that we shouldn't be living for ourselves. We shouldn't be living for this world. So I said that we were going to get into Malachi, and I just talked a lot. So Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. And it's kind of long, so stick with me. The Lord of heaven's army says to the priest, A son honors his father, and a servant respects his master. If I am your father and master... Where are the honor and respect I deserve? You have shown contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we ever shown contempt for your name? You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you ask, how have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. Verse 8, when you, bl- when you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Verse 9, go ahead, beg God to be merciful to you, but when you bring that kind of offering, why should he show you any favor at all, asks the Lord of heaven's armies. How I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and I will not accept your offerings. But my name is honored by people of other nations from morning till night. All around the world, they offer sweet incense and pure offerings in honor of my name. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Verse 12. But you dishonor my name with your actions by bringing contemptible food. You are saying it's all right to defile the Lord's table. You say it's too hard to serve the Lord. And you turn up your noses at my command, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Think of it. Animals are stolen and crippled and sick 
and sick are being presented as offerings. Should I accept them from you, such offerings as these? Asked the Lord. Verse 14. Cursed is the cheat who promises to give a fine ram from his flock, but then sacrifices a defective one to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and my name is feared among the nations. So it was kind of a long passage, but to sum it all up, the priests in Malachi's day, they were serving God leftovers. People would bring unblemished lambs to sacrifice to God, but then the priest would reason. They would say, well, it doesn't make sense to slaughter a perfectly good lamb, especially when it's just going to be burned on the altar. Let us sell it, and then we'll use the cheaper one as an offering. They may have thought that they were being good stewards, or maybe they had other excuses, but there's no excuse for not giving God our best. Amen? Amen. Did you say that with me? I think it should be up there. Yeah. There's no excuse for not giving God our best. And what do we do most days? We, we get ready for work or school. We go there. Then we drive home. Maybe we watch TV. And then we, give, we throw up some demands to God at the end of the day. And if that's you, think about it. Are you really giving God your best? Or are you just giving him leftovers? If it's just leftovers, you're basically saying, God will understand. I have work, right? You know, God understands. I can't give him all my time. But if you live like that, then you're going to be, you're being like the priest. And what did the priest think? They said, well, hey, we're, we're not rich people. Surely it makes sense to burn, you know, the, the cheaper ones. It, it, it makes sense to burn the blemished sacrifices instead and save the good ones. And they thought the Lord would understand, but no, he doesn't because he knows that he deserves much more. He's perfect. And we, I don't think we understand that. Like when people demand stuff, we're like, how can they demand it? But they're a sinful person. But God, he, he can demand it. And he doesn't, he, you know, it's not like he's a harsh taskmaster or anything. He asked for simple things, but they were starting to change it because they were getting comfortable this is after the time, just to give you a little background, um, before Malachi, before this uh, prophet, before Malachi came and said this to them, the temple was rebuilt. So they were kind of relaxing, you know, they're kind of, they're like, oh, everything's good now. And so they're kind of cutting corners and things. And so that's why it's showing how they got lukewarm. And that's why we need to be so careful. And that's why I bring this message to you today. So this is, like why I said, this is why God sent Malachi, because why the priests were dishonoring his name and they needed to be confronted. Look at verse 6 again. It says, they have shown contempt for my name. And the first thing I want to look at today is how we have dishonored and how we have shown contempt for his name by pulling down his holiness and by elevating our sin. So for you note takers, it's not really, I don't know if you call them points, but I just put them in kind of numbers. So the first one is we have dishonored God by pulling down his holiness and by elevating our sin. And so what were sacrifices for? Sacrifices in the Old Testament was a form of Jewish worship because before Christ died for us, we couldn't approach a holy God, right? So that's why... God ordains sacrifices so that it can cover our sins so that we can come before God. But then when you see priests like this offering blemished sacrifices, they were basically saying, God isn't perfectly holy. We don't need to offer a perfect substitute for our sins. How many of you guys know we're still sinners today? All of us. Everyone. But the reason we don't have to sacrifice lambs or rams or uh, that rhymes, but lambs or rams or doves or whatever. The reason we don't have to do that is why? Because Jesus has died for us. But if he has died for us, shouldn't we offer him more? Amen? Amen. We should offer him more. Like my dad said last week, people tithed in the Old Testament, but now we are in the New Testament. We have a better covenant. So would you tithe less or more to a better covenant? More. more. Amen. And if you say more, if you can't say more, then what are you doing? You're lifting up your sin like these priests in Malachi 1. And you're saying, we're not all that bad. Just, you know, a slightly blemished sacrifice is fine. That's fine. God doesn't need any more than that. 
You know, in my messages, when I, when I was first starting to preach and teach, people were telling me to preach the gospel in every message. The gospel is important, right? That's what we're supposed to spread. That's what we're supposed to teach. So I want the gospel shining through, and that's the core message of our church, amen? That's the core message of the church. But what's the gospel about? It's about sinners in need of a Savior, right? And that Savior reconciles us to God Almighty. Amen. So what are churches doing to the gospel now? They're modifying it, right? It's like mod pizza, you know, like, but it's like Alyssa's pizza. They're taking everything out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, Alyssa. I did not have that planned at all. I just flew in my mind right now. But, uh, yeah, she just has cheese. That's it. Yeah, not a lot of sauce either, right? And not too much cheese. Too much cheese could ruin it. It's very, it's a cheese crisp. There you go. <laughs> Where was it? <laughs> but, yeah, now you're hungry. <laughs> but, yeah, my, my dad, you know, he's been invited to things like focus groups and stuff and how to make your church grow and how to be cool. I'm just kidding. But... <laughs> But if people are modifying the message and if they're adjusting the product to just, like, appeal to consumers, if it's just a business to just get people in, then it's very easy to offer blemished offerings, right, blemished sacrifices. Like, if my dad came up here and he just starts dyeing his hair jet black and <laughs> starts preaching 15-minute sermonettes, what... <laughs> You, you, you know, if, if that sermonette was just preaching about how good you are, yeah. you know that there's some compromise there, right? Yeah. You know that yeah. something's changing, right. and we shouldn't change the truth of God, because once you change it, it's no longer the truth. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Right. So think about how the modern gospel is proclaimed. Nowadays, people just promote Christian, Christianity and what Jesus can do for you, right? right. Jesus can make you have a better business or a better family or even lose weight, you know? And even though those things might be true, that's not why we follow Jesus, right? That's not why. We want to give the gospel to people so that we can connect them with the Father. All right, so the second thing, we have been blinded to how we dishonor him. How many of you guys can agree with that, that we've been blinded? to how we dishonor him. Even pastors today, not my dad, but pastors today, they say, they kind of say that we're not too bad, you know? We're, yeah, I guess we're, we're, we have a little sin, but we're not too bad. But that's, if we're not too bad, then why did Jesus have to die for us, right? Why did he have to be beat? Why did he have to be crucified if we're okay? And we have too many Christians today acting like these priests, choosing to offer up things they can do without. And we might say, okay, I'm a Christian now, so like Cannon taught last night, he taught about uh, the tongue. And so if you, you're a Christian and you're like, okay, I'll surrender my tongue to God. So I'll take out cussing, but gossip, everyone gossips. Or what else is there with the tongue? There's gossip, strife, yeah, strife, lying. Everyone lies, right? But that same person might be like, oh, well, cussing, you know, it makes you kind of look uneducated and stupid anyway, so I'll just cut it out completely, and it's a win for me. But that's not the way we're supposed to do things, right? If you're just trying to give up part of control of your tongue, then you're not getting the picture. If you're just pick, picking what's convenient for you, then that's wrong, amen? amen. And that's why, that's the way these priests were thinking. They did what God's, they weren't doing what God was saying. They kind of were but they weren't. You know, there's no kind of, I'm kind of doing what God's saying. No, it's they weren't. Even though they were offering sacrifices, it was wrong. So end of verse 6. But you ask, how have we ever shown contempt for your name? Verse 7. You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you ask, how have we defiled your sacrifices? You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. Verse 8. When you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? Isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that 
to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So these people were blinded to how they had shown contempt to his name. And I think many of us can go throughout the day without even realizing how we have shown contempt to his name, how we have hurt God by our lack of love for others, or maybe giving reluctantly to him, or out of compulsion, right? Or maybe even just in worship, you're like, oh, this, is, this sounds like a cool song, so I'll start singing. But that's not what God wants. He wants true worshipers, amen? And you can see that. You see a lack of conviction in the church. Not, not just our church, but the church, you know, how much of America says they're Christians? 80, 80% or 85? Yeah, a lot of people in America say they're Christians, but where's that conviction, right? So look at verse 8. Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is. So I've heard that when Jimmy Carter was president, he would spend the night at homes, you know, just across America, just random homes. Is that true? I don't know if that's true. But just think if it was. Think if President Trump and his wife came to your home. You know, I'm just going to read it to you kind of as a story. The big evening arrives. Crowds line the streets as pre- the presidential limousine pulls up in front of your house, escorted by police motorcycles, squad cars, and secret service agents. The president and his wife emerge from the limousine, wave to the crowds and the news photographers, and walk to your front door. So you open the door, you're wearing dirty jeans and a torn t-shirt, and say, oh, hi, I've been working out in the garage. As the president steps into the cluttered living room, you say, sorry about the mess, but my wife got all caught up in soap operas on TV this afternoon, and so she didn't get around to cleaning. But dinner is almost ready. She's heating it up in the microwave, the leftovers. (laughs) Hope you don't mind paper plates. That, That would be silly, right? Silly story, but... Even if you're poor and you knew the president was coming, what would you do? You would try to look your best, right? You would try to clean your house. You would try to fix things if some of the things are broken. You put the best dishes on the table, right? And you would not cook leftovers. You would make your favorite dish, right? And the, if the president deserves more than leftovers, how much does God deserve? Amen? How much more does he deserve? Because the pre- president... Whoever the president is, would, he's a sinner, right? He or she is a sinner. But God, he's perfect. So look at uh, note three. We have been lukewarm giving God what we think is acceptable or convenient. We have been lukewarm giving God what we think is acceptable or convenient. And I don't think that we always are trying to dishonor him. Because you're not, I'm not saying you're purposely trying to dishonor him. But sometimes we think we give enough. Or sometimes we, I think some of the, our dishonor comes from being so blessed. And let me tell you what I mean by that. I think, how many of you guys believe you're blessed? Amen? We're all blessed. We live in America. We live in Oro Valley or pretty close to it, right? And what does Oro Valley stand for? It says the Valley of Gold, right? And you guys are all clothed. Thank God for that, or else my eyes would be melting. No. <laughs> but you guys are all breathing, too. Some of you are sleeping, but you're still breathing. That's good. No, I'm just kidding. But I think we're too blessed sometimes because it reminds me of Hosea 13.6. It says, when I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. And maybe we haven't forgotten God completely but I think America has forgotten God and we don't we still don't acknowledge him like we should and I don't want to say that you don't because I don't see your hearts but most people who call them Christians they seem to be lukewarm you know my dad's even asked in this church how many of you guys feel lukewarm and the majority of us say that but the question is how are we going to get on fire again amen How are we going to get that fire again? I read this by Oswald Chambers the other day. We cannot stay forever on the Mount of Transfiguration, basking in the light of our mountaintop experience, but we must obey the light we receive there. We must put it into action. When God gives us a vision, 
We must transact business with him at that point, no matter what the cost. Amen? So we're not always going to have that mountaintop feeling or that mountaintop high or whatever you call it. But when Jesus hands you the fire, don't just stay on the mountain and just let it fade. Go down to the mountain, spread it, right? Go spread it and do the work. Don't just stand still and get stuck in rituals like these people in Malachi. But look at the priests. They were looking. They took a look at all their activities. They said, how have we offended you, God? How have we defiled your name? We offer sacrifices. We lead your people in worship. What's the problem, God? And I can even get like these priests. I, I say, Lord, I'm leading worship. I'm preaching your word. I'm reaching out. Why don't I feel that close to you? And whenever I find myself in that place, this is what God says. He usually says this, because your focus is still on yourself. You aren't doing it for me so much as you're doing it for yourself. And that breaks my heart, but it awakens me. It awakens my heart to get back on track. And we need people like Malachi. We need people like my dad, like Kevin, to speak the truth and to speak that godly correction in our lives so that we don't continue in that path of destruction. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> it's getting hot up here now. <laughs> Yeah, it's always hot up here. But in this chapter, we see that people weren't offering sacrifices to please the Lord. They weren't, they weren't focused on magnifying his name. They seemed bored. And how many of you guys have seen bored Christians? It's very boring. It doesn't even make you want to be a Christian when you see bored Christians. Because that's not offering God your best. And, and don't fool each other. Don't fool people by acting like, oh, I'm not bored, you know. It's easy to fool people. It's real easy to lead worship. You could just say, okay, give me this set list. I'll just play it. Boom, we're done. It's even easy to preach. You know, you can just read someone's sermon, right? It's easy to teach Sunday school. You could just get a lesson plan from someone and just teach it. It's easy even to serve. Like you can, if you're serving only when it's, complete, when it's just convenient to you and you're just like, and it's just to be seen by others. That's the completely wrong motives. And to know if your motives are right, I like to ask myself this. Is my motive to make people think highly of me? And if it is, then it's usually wrong. Amen? Amen. It's not right before God. When I preach, if I yield to temptation and I don't preach the hard things or I, I shy away from those things, then I might not be offending you, but who am I dishonoring? God, and he's the one that we should never want to dishonor. Amen? Amen? I just think of all the times that I've offered that defiled food to God. I've, you know, filled sermons with myself, and it doesn't feel good afterward. You know, you, you, you might feel good. Like, everyone's like, oh, that was a great sermon. But then you go home, and then you're just like, I'm sorry, God. You know, God says, was that for you or for me? So I want to ask you this. Is your time with God sloppy? And what I mean by that is, do you spend time laboring in prayer and meditation over God's word to seek his will for your life? Or do you just throw up a couple prayers for your food? Is your love for God cold? Are you passionate about the things of God? Or have you become an old, cranky, crusty Christian? You guys don't like that word, right? Crusty. <laughs> Saw some face ago. But <laughs> it reminds me of this video that Sarai showed us. It was... Uh, Baked in a buttery, flaky crust. How many of you guys have seen that video? It's pretty funny. Only the, only the college people. Yeah. If you guys want to look it up, you know, it's just two older folks. They're trying to do a commercial. And it's just a bunch of different takes, and they can't say that. It's a hard thing to say. So it's really funny. So if you guys are bored, just look that up. But... That's off the point. So maybe your passion is for things like football for, or golf or just hanging out with friends. This week I noticed my passion was starting to be for like mo motorcycle riding. And I don't even have a motorcycle yet. I just got my license and then I was just thinking about it and I was about to buy a bike and that didn't go through. But the way I justified it was, oh, yeah, I'm going to go ride off and then go pray. Right? We justify things like that. And even though I would do that. Still, I just want to ride to ride, right? And that was, 
And then I was like praying, and that, that was on my mind. I was like, I'm sorry, God. But we can, we can have passions for other things rather than God sometimes. And this, oh, never mind. And then number four. I put three instead of four, but this is our fourth one. Yeah. Honor God by giving him your best. Amen. Amen. Honor God by giving him your best. We have been given the free gift of salvation. You guys know that, right? And we can't earn it. We can't pay for it. Like that song, Reckless Love. I, I, it's hard for me when I don't sing it, but I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. But you gave yourself for me, right? Something like that. Yeah, I need to sing it in order to. I'll just let David sing it, you know. <laughs> David loves to sing. <laughs> yeah, in the opera voice. <laughs> But we tend to forget that part that Jesus demands our life in response of that salvation, right? And we forget that part. It's like selective listening. How many of you had, have children and you've told them something, but they just hear what they want to hear? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you tell them, clean your room and then you can do this. But they hear, oh, we're going to go get ice cream. Cool. But they don't hear, oh, I got to clean my room, right? But if, we're, if we shouldn't do that to our parents... How much more should we not do that to God? Amen? His truth is clear in his word, and we must read it with eyes wide open, allowing all of it to penetrate our hearts, not just the things we want to accept or the things that we want to allow, but all of it. Amen? Amen. So I like 1 Corinthians 6.20 because it's talking about how we're not our own. We were bought with a high price, high price, not priced, and that we must honor God. And since we've been given so much, so freely, how can we hold back anything for God? Amen? The priests were offering God leftovers. They decided to give God what they didn't need. But God says in verse 10 a very scary thing. Look at verse 10. How I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and I will not accept your offerings. Do you guys hear what God's saying here? He's saying that he would rather them shut their doors than to offer these cheap sacrifices. And may that never be said of our church, amen? amen. We need to check ourselves and take a look at what we're offering God. I wrote this note up here because I thought, I thought it was pretty good. It's, do we offer parts of our life only when it's convenient? Or do we offer our whole life even when it might inconvenience us. So is it just parts when we feel like it, or our whole life, even when it's hard? Because when you give God what you don't really need, are you really giving at all? If you give, like, think about, like, giving junk to missions or or to the church, things that are broken and falling apart, you're like, we're not a junkyard, right? (laughs) Like, it's just, uh, it's more of a burden for us. But, or if you just give something, you know, it could still be nice, but if you give something you don't really need, it's not, it's, it's, you don't really feel like you're giving, right? It's not like you really care about it anyway, so you kind of want to get rid of it. But how can you tell you really gave? Your flesh, right? Your flesh is going to be screaming, no, don't give that, right? But think about your time or service. If you only serve when it's convenient to you and when you have nothing better to do, then you're not really serving either. The Pharisees, remember what the Pharisees do? They were big givers. They gave probably more than all of us. But what was the thing that God was impressed with? He wasn't impressed with how much they gave. He was impressed with the little widow. And why was that? Because she gave everything she had to live on. She gave out of her need. And we can, we can give out of our surplus and stuff, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if we're, if we're just boasting on that, and thinking, oh, we're so great, but then you see someone giving much more, even though it was the, it, may, it might have been like a penny compared to their, I don't know how much money they had back then, but if it was just even a penny, that's all she had to give, you know? And so your gift reveals your estimate of the one to whom you offer it. And that's kind of confusing, so I, I wrote it up there. I'm going to read it again. Your gift reveals your estimate of the one to whom you offer it. And you think about that, like like if you're married, 
right? Your husband or wife, you give them better gifts than you do a stranger, right? Or a coworker, because you value them more, right? You love them. And in John 12, 1 through 8, we read about Mary of Bethany. I love this. I love this passage. It's about Mary. She breaks this expensive alabaster jar over Jesus' feet. And people say that it's probably like a year's worth wage. I don't know how to say that. But you know, you know what I mean. But it's very expensive, right? And I can humbly and sadly say that I probably would be like, I think it was even Judas who said, Why why this waste? You know, why you could be you could sell this and give the money to the poor. Why why waste it all right here? But what did Jesus say to his disciples? He rebuked them. And that's how important worship is. That's how important it is to sacrifice for God. G. Campbell Morgan, I like this guy. I guess he's <laughs> my name. But uh it says, sacrilege is centered in offering God something which costs nothing because you think God is worth nothing. So when you give God your best in terms of cost, you're honoring him, right? But think about what it costs you to serve God. Does it really cost you that much? Think about your life here in America. Does it really cost you that much to be a Christian? And if it doesn't, maybe you're living like the world more than you think. David said this in 2 Samuel 24, 24. I will not present burnt offerings to my Lord, to the Lord my God, that have cost me nothing. You know, people were giving David sacrifices. He's like, you could use this, David. But he's like, no, I want to cost me to know the reality of my sin, to know what he's done for us. And he didn't even, he, he didn't even die for them back then. But he's died for us, and he died for them still. But I'm saying we're, we're behind you know, we're in the New Testament after his death, and we're going to celebrate his death and resurrection this next week. Amen? Amen? So here are some things that we should give to the Lord, and it's just, it's just a couple things. We should give the Lord our best in terms of priorities. So in our passage in Malachi 1, we see that God's word, it wasn't a priority to his people. They had better ideas on how they could use clean animals rather than, uh, rather than giving them as a sacrifice, right? God said to honor him above all, though. He said in their worship to offer unblemished sacrifices, but it was a low priority on their list. They showed contempt for what God valued, right? God valued that. And when you show contempt for what he values, who are you really showing contempt for? You're showing contempt for God, yeah. And so that's why you need to be, you need to understand what he asks of us and not take that lightly, Amen. So if God values worship, do you worship like he wants you to? Or do you worship him only when you're happy or only when you're feeling good or only when you have extra time? Matthew 6.33 says what? You guys all know this verse probably. Seek first the kingdom. Yeah. Seek first his kingdom and righteousness, right? And that doesn't just apply to me. That doesn't just apply to missionaries. That doesn't apply to just people in full-time ministry. Who does that apply to? Everybody, right? All of us. That applies to all of us to seek first his kingdom. So ask yourself, am I valuing, valuing what God values? Does the way I spend my time, my money, my efforts, does all that reflect the things that matter most to God? Am I seeking God first in my personal life, in my business, my family, and even my spare time. And the best way that i found to keep my mind cleansed and to keep my priorities in check is by constantly, what? Studying the Word of God. And it's not like we can't study the Word of God. We have more access to it than ever, right? We have it on our phones. You know, we probably have tons of Bibles at home. Even if you just have one paper Bible, we probably have more devices that we can put them on, Right? And so we have access to it, but now we need to study it. We need to do it. Amen? Amen. And we need to let God's word direct our path and keep us on course when we start to drift. It's amazing because God's word, when you read it, it confronts you on the things like the wrong attitudes. It confronts you on the wrong values. And when you're valuing other things above God, his word quickly reminds you that your aim should be to glorify him instead. Amen? So the second thing is we should give God our best 
in our personal integrity. In our personal integrity. How many of you guys know how important how important motives are? Yeah, they're very important, especially when coming before God. Verse 14 of this passage says, Cursed is the cheat who promises to give a fine ram from his flock, but then sacrifices a defective one to the Lord. God's saying, don't try to look good before man. Don't say you're going to give an unblemished lamb when you really are going to slip in a blemished one at the end. When it comes to giving, give God your best. And it's evil to give anything less. And God doesn't want you to fear man. We know that. We talk about it all the time. I'm no longer a slave to fear, amen? But if we aren't going to fear men, then don't just come here to worship before people. Also worship at home, amen? amen? And because we were talking about this, when you pray in that secret place, when you come before God consistently, you're showing that you really believe that he's real, right? You really love him and you want to spend that time with him. Amen. And you guys remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? Like when they gave, and it was kind of like a form of worship, but they gave, and what happened to them? They were killed, and they weren't killed because they gave, so don't be worried about that, but it was because they lied. It's because they lied to look good before men. They wanted the church to think that they were giving the total amount of the sale that they had on their land, but they kept back some of it. And they, give, they gave probably more than they needed, a lot more than they needed, but, they didn't, but their motives were wrong, right? And what did Peter say before they were struck dead? He said that you're not lying to men, you're lying to God. Andrew Fuller, he was once soliciting, he's a guy from the 18th century, and he was soliciting funds for foreign missions. A good friend said to him, very well, Andrew. Seeing it as you, I'll give $500. That's probably a lot back then. It's still a lot today. $500 back in the 18th century. And Fuller responded, No, I cannot take the money since you give it seeing me. His friend saw the point and said, You're right, Andrew. Here's $1,000 seeing it is for the Lord Jesus. So that's saying our aim should be glorifying God in everything we do, right? It shouldn't be for man. And that means through everything, whether it be physically, mentally, or emotionally, everything should be given to God, all our best, not our leftovers. Amen? Amen. So let God's word speak to you. Because when we saw the priest, they weren't letting God's word speak to them. They were changing things, and they were actually despising him. So don't fool yourselves. Don't let the world tell you that you're a good person. Don't let even pastors tell you that you're good people, because once you believe that, you're never going to change. You're never going to be in the place where God wants you to be. And you're never going to walk in holiness if you think you're good. So here are some things. There's just a few things before we end just to think on. And don't worry, we're almost done. Is your service for God less than you would offer a famous person or someone that you respect? So think about that. If you were doing a Bible study, right? And you have maybe, think about Charles Spurgeon or, or just a big speaker, maybe like Francis Chan, like a, a man of God that people think is a man of God. They came to your Bible study. Would you prepare it any differently? What if Keith Green or Matt Redman or whoever, whatever worship leader you think is famous nowadays, Brian Johnson, if these people were sitting next to you in worship, would you sing a little louder? Would you be more enthusiastic? Would you offer more in the offering bag? And I ask this because we usually put on our best for people, right? We put on our best for people we, we respect. But Jesus is always watching, and we should respect him above all. Amen? Amen? He listens to everything we say. He watches everything we do. And the next question is, God answering your prayers. If you're giving God leftovers day after day, if you're dishonoring his name... How can you sincerely ask him to bless you? Verse 9 says, when you bring that kind of offering, why should he show you any favor at all? So saying like if you're just playing games and you're just trying to use him to get to heaven, then why should he answer your prayers? Why would he answer you when you don't want to take that time to really have that relationship with him, to cultivate that re relationship? 
Next thing is, are you playing church? The priests, they were going through the motions because, you know, they kept the fires burning, right? They kept the fires burning on the altar, but it was not the right sacrifice. It was useless to God. So think about that. Is that you? Do you just do church just to satisfy God for the week? You think that's good? Or just to look good before your family or your friends? God says in verse 10, He wishes that none of them would shut the, that one of them, sorry, He wishes that one of them would shut the temple doors so that worthless sacrifices could not be offered. He would rather them close their doors than have them worship because their worship was not right. Just think about how many doors that, or how many doors of churches God will want to shut today. God doesn't care how many people even attend this church because if we're just giving them leftovers, if we're not really worshiping him, then, and we're just giving him the leftovers of our worldly lives, then he's not going to be impressed with that. He's not going to want that. And he doesn't look at our activities. He, still, he looks at our activities, he sees them, but he really looks at what? We know, the heart. He looks at the heart. John 4, 23. He look, he's looking for worshipers who worship in what? In spirit and in truth. Amen. Have you lost your passion for God? This is the last one, so don't worry. Have you lost your passion for God? Really think about that. The priests were tired. You know, they're just, they just got in a routine. In verse 13, it says, it's too hard to serve the Lord. You know, they would just offer up another animal. They would go through the motions one more time, you know, put in their shift at the temple, and then collect their paycheck and go home. And they were bored because they have lost sight of God and his majesty. Look at, if you look at this passage, it says the Lord of heaven's armies. How many times does it say it? Does anyone know? It says it seven times throughout the whole passage. And that means that he commands all, all the armies of heaven, all the universe, all the galaxies in the universe. So if you're bored with worshiping and serving a God like that, then you've lost sight of his glory and his majesty. The Christian life shouldn't be just a ritual, right? We know that it shouldn't be a routine or anything like that. We are serving the living God, and he's never boring. Amen? Yeah. He's never boring. And when you experience God, how many of you guys have ever experienced God, and you just want to get out, get out of there? No, most of the time when we experience God, we're never looking at the watch, right? We're never looking at the time. We just want, we want more. Amen? And that's how our life should be. And I'm not saying you're never going to have that, have to discipline yourself to start reading the word of God or have a quiet time. But if you're constantly bored in worship, then I think you, I know you need a fresh glimpse of God. Amen? Amen. So offer God your best in everything you do. Like Colossians 3.23, we would always uh, use this for football. Cannon loves this verse too, right, Cannon? Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And it's not saying heart, heartily work for God. It's not saying that. It's saying with your heart, right? With everything you have, work for the Lord and not for men, right? So don't fear man. He deserves much more even than our best. He deserves much more than it. But the best is the best we can give, right? So that's what we need to give. So at least give him that. And remember, what's the title? No more leftovers. Say that with me. One, two, three. No more leftovers. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, God, that you're so kind and merciful to us, but we don't want to take that mercy for granted. We don't want to just walk upon your grace and just live for self. God, we know that's not what you've called us to do. And so I pray, God, that uh, if you've been speaking to our hearts, I pray that you have and that we've been listening. I know that you have, but I pray that we have open hearts to take in all of it, God. And I thank you, God, that uh, you have been so kind and loving, and we just want to give you our lives. We want to submit to you. Thank you, God, that we can even worship right now, even worship by listening to your word, by coming to, before you right now. And I just pray that we can do this not just at church, but that we will go home, go in the quiet place, and spend that time with you. 
to show you that we believe you're real, God. We love you, and we want that relationship with you. So I pray that you will bless your people as they go out, that, that this day uh, would be a day where we, we get to wake up again. We get to say, okay, God, I'm sorry that I've dishonored you. I've been blinded. Open my eyes, God. And we thank you for your love. And we just want to love like you do, God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. We're going to worship a little, yeah, a little more. So you guys can stand up. It's going to take me a second to get ready.
guys okay with doing one more? Yeah. Amen.